All right, we're going to start with the main event. Please welcome Zena to talk about adversary detection fireflies. Good morning. How's the volume? Good, good, good. Thank you so much for showing up this morning. I know that uh, there's a million and one better things to do, like, I don't know, get eggs or coffee or whatever. So thank you for being here in person. And just a brief disclaimer, this on a scale of DEF CON to Black Hat, this is more on the Black Hat range of information. So just FYI, so that you get an idea of what to expect and so that you know you're in the right place, Adversary Detection Pipeline, Xena Olson, Cyber Threat Intelligence, and I am Cheerio on the Twitters, and that's CH33R10. Feel free to uh, tweet away, just nice stuff though. Okay. So this is for the lawyers. I'm not here representing my company at all in any way, shape, or form, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them, and I'm on my individual capacity. So I'm gonna start out with a very brief conversation about pain points, background information as to some, some baseline information that would be a good idea to know before engaging this particular project. And then some approaches and methods, some ideas that might be helpful um, from speaking with a lot of different people and doing a ton of research and other things that I can't talk about publicly. Uh, and then just what it is and how to do it, basically. So <clears throat> I, did a, I did a talk at the RSA, I did a session, and there happened to be someone from Microsoft in my audience. And when I was sharing information, they're like, oh, but wait, 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 you know, because they have such an amazing security team. So this talk is not for them. Like, they have tools beyond Excel. Like, I am trying to present a methodology and information that pretty much anyone can use. You don't need advanced scripting skills. You don't need to be a kung fu anything, really. Um, you just use critical thinking and Excel. So that is my goal with this. So it's not for the Microsofts of the world, just FYI. So some of the pain points that I've heard people talk about with cyber threat intelligence is uh, basically it's not timely. So they get stuff that's like really old and that's been expired a long time ago or it was only malicious for a short amount of time and then the SOC gets alerts on it and they're like, why is it bad? And they're like, well, we don't really know. And then uh, the information or contextual information for the various uh, IOCs and stuff that are alerting on it that doesn't have all the information that they need. So uh, that's one of the issues that cyber threat intelligence faces in enterprise or companies in general. Uh, outdated, of course, uh, more platforms. So sometimes with some of the SOC analysts that I speak with, they don't like switching between so many different platforms. Like, it's, it's not necessarily in their workflow. So <clears throat> to be able to work with the tools that they currently work with and to tailor a program and intelligence around that, that's what I'm recommending instead of trying to get involved with behavioral modification of an entire SOC, right? That's, that's a lot, that'll take a lot of time. So baby steps. And then the other thing is irrelevant. So if you're, um, I know, uh, so let's say you're pulling in like a bunch of hashes, right? And like the hashes have absolutely nothing to do with anything and you're just pulling hashes in because you're pulling hashes, right? Like that's completely irrelevant and not necessarily very useful. So uh, my goal with this talk is to uh, talk about internal data so that you can leverage it for your threat intelligence. The other thing is uh, cyber threat intelligence analysts, sometimes they use a lot of public reports. There's nothing wrong with that, but when you focus all of your effort and energy on let's say FIN7, you know, off of Katie Nichols' talk yesterday, and you don't look at your internal attack data, um, that can leave some gaps and some holes. So for instance, let's say um, 
what was it, this year, earlier this year, they're like, oh, ransomware's bad, whatever, right? And then you look at your internal attack data, and you're like, we're not even hardly getting any ransomware. Like, what is this? What are they talking about, you know? And you build out your program, and you're like, ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. And then um, the thing is, you're not really necessarily being attacked by that. There's just an example, right? Uh, you're being attacked with other stuff, and there's gaps and holes regarding that, but it's a blind spot. So what I'm saying is, looking at the internal attacks that you're seeing coming at your particular organization will be helpful with understanding where you're at in the threat, threat landscape. And then, of course, also, too, uh, looking at your verticals. So, for instance, I'm with a financial services company or even um, some of my other part-time jobs that I have as well. And being aware of the various attacks that are coming at it um, back in the day when I ran a business, I would, I didn't have the official title of cyber threat intelligence analyst, I had business owner. So as a business owner, I kept up to date with the various attacks that not only I was getting internally, but also what my uh, colleagues were seeing as well. And then I would educate my particular clients on that. So kind of taking the same ideas and methodologies that I used in my business for 15 years and applying that in enterprise at scale. The other thing is uh, Red Team. So I love, our, I love Red Team. Uh, they're amazing. They're, <laughs> they're so smart and uh, highly skilled. Uh, but sometimes some Red Team speaking with other CTI analysts and uh, people in other organizations, they like to go for the fancy hacks, right? Like Mr. Robot and um, some of those really fancy ones that you're like, wow, like this would probably never happen. Like um, just the possibility of it happening is very slim. So you know, emulating Mr. Robot attacks or, or really fancy hacks of like printers and Raspberry Pis and blah, 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 like that's fine and good. Um, but I'm suggesting as well incorporating emulation of the attack data that's specific to your particular organization. And the other thing is, uh, so, the thing that I've found too, as a small business owner, I pretty much had control over everything and communications with everyone. So I didn't really have to worry about being in silos. In enterprise, it's like every single group has their own little special area and sometimes it's, it can be a little bit difficult to foster the communication and relationships between the teams. So. Um, what, what I'm suggesting is that with the timely and actionable intelligence from internal threat data, they, the teams can have a shared mission so that essentially they can foster collaboration and work together to build out the adversary detection pipelines that works for the particular teams and the business initiatives. So it can be a collaborative thing instead of having, instead of just having your individual team goals I guess you could say. Uh, it's more like an overreaching goal for uh, cyber threat intelligence for your particular security department. So it's, a, it's the same thing, but looking at it a little bit differently and encouraging collaboration. So why aren't people using it? A lot of times people think that you are required to know crazy scripting, you have to code, you have to do all this stuff, right? Or um, they're like, oh, well, we only have open source IOX. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like you have so much more than just the open source IOX or the free feeds or even the paid threat feeds. So uh, the other thing is people think that they should only try to look at the threat actors that are popular, you know, like the fancy bears, the grim spiders, like. Uh, let's see, APT33, APT34, APT10, right? Uh, but because the internal threat data is not quote unquote sexy or a bear or a panda or any of those other things or popular or in the news, um, like what sounds better? Oh yeah, you know, we were getting attacks by a fancy bear versus yeah, we have some TTPs of blah, blah, blah. Like uh, 
So being able to not be lured by the sexy and work with what's internal to your org. And it's really easy to start. Like I said, you just need Excel, cognitive thinking, um, uh, critical thinking skills, and access to your internal attack data. So a little bit of background info so that everyone can be kind of on the same page. How many uh, CTI analysts do we have in here? Okay, so you guys can like turn off. <laughs> like, uh, so attribution is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So when you have all of your internal attack data, um, being able to attribute it to APT10 or APT33, APT34, you know, Fancy Bear, all of that, Cozy Bear, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And there are multiple attribution frameworks that you would have to deal with in order to even start approaching the issue of attribution. So Jason D. Jolly, he got his PhD, and he wrote a dissertation and a book on this. So for instance, technical attribution, recursive traceback. Uh, there's a whole book, like a whole actual like hundreds of pages on this. So if you're interested in it, I would highly recommend um, reading it. There's forensics, forensic attribution. So for instance, let's say that you want to map back the internal TAC data to uh, what other people are seeing in the industry, whether APT10 or APT1, right? Um, there are some things that DEFER would need to do or whatever your team is that does incident response and collection of data. And these are just some of the items that they would probably need to find or collect for the various uh, attacks or malware that's being sent to your particular organization. Indirect attribution, so uh, this has to do more with uh, dealing with uh, nation states like in between the jurisdictions of the various countries. So it's not, it's not easy because the bad guys like to do proxy chaining, right? So you do one proxy and then you pro hop to another proxy and then another proxy and another proxy. So even though the IP says it's from Russia, it might not be Russia. So things like that. And then they like to uh, hop through non uh, uh, countries where there's not a uh, uh, like, uh, political infrastructure set up in order to handle like engaging extradition of those people and the data as well. So Jason DeJolly, he says uh, basically that there's no single technical attribution technique that's adequate to attribute uh, cyber attacks. So even if you got all of the forensic information, like you need additional information on top of that. So it's a lot. And Robert M. Lee, the course author of Forensics 578, he said that basically true attribution is kind of time consuming and resource intensive and not everyone in the planet needs to do it. Like the value add for like private companies to move forward with true attribution might be a little much. So what I recommend is using TTPs and that's tactics, techniques, and procedures, and that's basically the how and the what of an attack. The other thing is naming structure, so you'll see APT33, and you'll see Fancy Bear, and you'll see all of these other names for like the same group, right? And that's because, for instance, if you look at FireEye, right, they get certain data sets. CrowdStrike gets other data sets. And both of these companies have different analysts analyzing the information in order to do proper attribution and put it in the right bucket, essentially. So me, as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, I don't know what the other analysts saw or didn't see versus what I have in my own data or how they interpret it how they um, got the got the particular data, like how, how did they do it? And I'm not privy to that information because there's only so many places I can work. So uh, because of that, that's why a lot of cyber threat intelligence analysts make their internal naming structure because they don't have that extra context that you need in order to properly attribute the attacks that you're getting. 
The other thing is, it's, like I said earlier, very resource intensive. So <laughs> it's like if you, if you have a larger organization, right, and you only have one or two cyber threat intelligence analysts, and there's, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people that they have to oversee, like, making sure, uh, like, being proactive with the threats that are happening in the landscape. Like, it's a little difficult to keep up with that with uh, short staff, essentially. And then tradecraft. So not only do you need to know all that other stuff I talked about, but you also have to be familiar with the politics uh, what's going on in the environment during that particular time in that particular region, uh, like uh, the use of various words for specific things. Like you have to have a better and deep understanding of geopolitics and uh, be up to date with current events. I mean, that's why uh, if you look at cyber threat intelligence an analysts, they tend to they tend to sometimes specialize in like Russia or EMEA or Iran or one of those other areas, right? Because it's so much information to keep up to date with and to be an expert and be able to speak intelligently about. Like I'll be the first to say that I am not an expert in any of those areas. So I go to the people that focus on it and spend all their time like learning the tradecraft of the various threat actors of the particular area. The other thing is attackers can essentially cover their tracks. So I think it was a Tim Maurer in Cyber Mercenaries. He also shared that uh, independent hackers can act as like a proxy for nation states. So nation state will be like, hey, Mr. Hacker, like can you hack these people on our behalf? And so it looks like it might be an independent hacker, hacker but it's really nation state sponsored. And for me, like, I, I honestly would have a hard time telling the difference. So that's the other thing. Um, and it, the threat actors like to kind of hide in normal traffic and use, like, commodity malware, some of them, right? So it's like, how do you tell the difference between um, a script kitty that got a nanocore rat for free, right, versus a nation state threat actor that's like, oh, we're gonna pwn them with this. So um, it's it can be difficult. I do not have the skill set to tell the difference between that. So the other thing, um, so false flags. Um, this one, it was rumored that it was North Korea, then Russia. And if you look at a blog by, um, by Talos, they have multiple different threat ac activity groups or threat actors that they think uh, did the Olympic destroyer. And really, it, there still is kind of a big question mark because of the forensic uh, indicators for that. And Jake Williams, I don't know if he's here, but he did a, um, he did a really great Black Hat talk at Black Hat Europe. And then he also did a DerbyCon talk as well in 2019 regarding false flags. So if you want more in-depth information about that, I highly recommend checking out his talks because he's really smart and knows this stuff very well. So here's some approach and methods for adversary detection pipelines. So what is it? It's just a way of packaging your cyber threat intelligence to feed different initiatives within your organization. So for instance, uh, there's a business focus. So that's kind of looking at your 10K and annual reports. Then there's the security team or security department focus. And then there's the CTI team focus. And they end up being also a customer of the adversary detection pipelines. <coughs> so business initiatives. Uh, something that you can do right now, if you want, is pull up your company's annual report. They should be out by now. Or even the most recent 10K or 10Q. And in that, um, in, there's a management discussion, at least on visas, where they, uh, the managers kind of interpret the information and, and say where they want to go or things that they want to see happen. So when you look at that stuff, you can get an idea as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, like where the company is heading long term. And because it's publicly available, that means that if I were a bad guy, I would read that and I would look at what type of initiatives the company's doing and I would target that 
as well. So uh, one, one good example, I think in Visa's annual report, they said they wanted to build out their uh, POS services uh, to their customers. So uh, I would definitely look at like the different teams involved with it, the attacks that are being sent to those particular teams that are involved with that particular business initiative. I would look at third parties involved with that. I would look at the hardware. I would look at the software, like everything that's involved and that goes into making that initiative happen and be successful. I would look at and see how I could provide value to those particular teams. So this is just a repeat of that, how to support it. So hardware controls, are there vulnerabilities, are there outstanding, um, uh, so not, not all companies like patch things right away, right? I'm not gonna name names. So let's say that there's like a really bad vulnerability that's out there that hasn't been patched yet and you're still at, I don't know, even if it's like 15 or 20% that aren't patched yet, like that's, that's pretty big. So if the company, if the growth of the company hinges upon this particular initiative or what they want to do, then as a CTI analyst, I would look at that and look at any particular vulnerabilities that are nasty um, that need to be patched uh, quickly uh, that could potentially result in pwnage. So these are just some ideas that you guys can use. So deliverables, looking at the internal attack data. So for instance, um, you have the people that receive emails, right? And then you can understand the various exploits, if there's exploits in there, what type of malware variants they're getting, are they being sent uh, spear phishing campaigns, like what is going on? Are they trying to get them to respond? Are they trying to do BEC with them? Um, things like that, like really getting a good idea of what type of attacks are being directed to the particular business units that are involved with that. And then also external threat intelligence. So this is where the external threat reports come in handy to be able to review and uh, see if there's any mention. Because sometimes when you're going through reports, they, they have like a little sentence or a little mention here and there. And uh, to be honest, that's kind of saved uh, that's helped me uh, in my day-to-day -day where I question, oh, that's not a big deal. Oh, well, why do I feel it's not a big deal? Or why do I think that? So I use a little bit of the uh, structured analytic techniques with the thoughts that I'm having in order to dive into stuff. And when you do that, sometimes you can find compromised vendors before they're onboarded onto your system. Um, things like that where just asking a few extra questions and looking at things with uh, critical thinking and the structured analytic techniques by Richard Skewer uh, is definitely helpful and I highly recommend it. So the internal security team initiatives. So it depends on your org structure, right? So you can have a cybersecurity department and then of course you have your red team, you have your defer, you have your SOC, you have your uh, project management, like whatever whatever you have in your security team, each team has different goals that they have to meet for the year. So <clears throat> what, what would be helpful is understanding where they wanna be in a year from now and then finding out how you can contribute to that. So an example would be, let's say red team, they're like, okay, for 2020, we want to run six emulation exercises and one simulation exercise. And you're like, okay, cool. So as a CTI analyst, first of all, what's the difference between emulation and simulation, right? Emulation is basically copying the TTPs of the threat actor and using that within your environment. And then simulation is using a tool that one of your threat actors uses and kind of testing how that is within the environment or being being attacked at the environment. So with that, I would look at the various internal threat data, threat activity groups, and then I would prioritize them and then provide red team with the top six threat actors to emulate for the past you know, year or quarter so that they can do that and build that out over the year because it's not, uh, running emulation exercises aren't, you know, they can't just like look at it and then like run it 
automatically. Like they have to plan it, they have to set stuff up, right? I'm not a red teamer, so I don't know everything that goes into it. I just know that it's definitely time consuming and they can't just like, oh, well, you know, emulate these TTPs in this red activity group and they can't just go do it. So helping them with planning and getting them information uh, so that they can build out their program and meet their goals that they set for that year is helpful. And that was just one example. And then, of course, metrics as well. <clears throat> so operational environment. Uh, let's see. Scott J. Roberts, and uh, he, wrote, he wrote a blog, and he's done a ton of stuff. If you are interested in cyber threat intelligence at all, Scott J. Roberts is an awesome person to consume all of his data. And then the other person, Brian P. Keim, he is actually at Forrester right now, and he wrote a really great paper on threat intelligence planning. So I took the information from both of those people, some of my business ideas and then, uh, or experience, and then put it in here regarding the operational environment and things that would be helpful for you to understand prior to building out the adversary detection pipeline. So, for instance, understanding attacks, if they come external to internal, and then also internal to external, reviewing the threat actors that have historically targeted your particular organization, if you have that information, uh, reviewing cognitive biases and logical fallacies. So that's how, um, that's kind of how uh, people are like, wow, how did you do that? Where did you find that information? And really it was just by asking questions of like why I was thinking a certain way and then uh, finding uh, supporting information to refute my hypothesis, uh, essentially. But there's whole books on it. I don't need to go into it. Uh, definitely check out Richard Sewer on that one. And uh, the other thing that I found was really helpful is reviewing all of the previous information from past cyber threat intelligence analysts. So I kind of get an idea of what went well, uh, what they want, what they don't want. And then here's some data collection requirement ideas. And this is from Rebecca Brown and Robert M. Lee from the CTI SANS survey. And if you get a chance, reading all of the SAN surveys are actually exceedingly helpful. That's how I got a lot of these ideas, to be honest. And that's how I uh, look at trends over time and get an idea of where people are going and what they're doing and um, what they're looking into. For instance, there's a threat hunting survey, and they said that they're moving towards uh, looking at their internal attack data and so as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, that makes me think, how can I package the information that I'm collecting or that I have to be valuable to the threat hunting teams because they're trending that way towards using internal attack data. So here's just some ideas, uh, looking at internal tickets, the WAF attacks, um, email analysis, endpoint IDS. You all already know this because you're here. So the other thing is when you're prioritizing threat activity groups to pass off to other groups, you know, for instance, the red team example, they want to do six emulation exercises. If you're tracking, I don't know, let's say 20 activity groups, how do you narrow down the 20 groups to six, right? Um, it's like you have intent, capability, and opportunity, which is a definition of a threat. So intent, they already have the intent, because they're sending you, it's based off your, off your internal attack data that you're building this off of, your email. So you, you already have it intent, right? Capability. So if they're sending you Emotet and they're sending you TrickBot and both of them are blocked, how do you prioritize which one of those is more, I guess you could say, important, right? For the TTPs associated with that particular threat activity group. Um, I couldn't come up with a good answer to that. Uh, so then I moved on to opportunity and I was like, okay, I think I'm making some headway here. And with opportunity, I look at my perception of the attacker's knowledge of my particular environment. So an example of this, right? Let's say that your particular organization whitelists Google Drive and Google Docs, okay? 
and let's say that you're getting attacks or emails with malicious uh, links to Google Drive, which has a Google Doc, and you know, essentially if someone clicked on it, uh, you could execute that on your particular uh, endpoint, right? So that's one level. Okay, so they, they may or may not know, they may have gotten lucky, you know. So then I take it one step further and I look at if they're sending it to like a service account, you know, like info at company.com, like that's easy to find. Or someone on like the annual reports that I suggested reading or the 10Ks or any of the publicly published information. Uh, if they're using or scraping that information and then sending a tax to those particular individuals, that is another, like, well, you know, anyone could get that. But if they're sending it to people within your particular organization that are not easy to OSINT, and then take that a step further, your internal org structure. So for instance, let's say they send it to an admin admin assistant, and then they spoof that it's coming from their boss or their boss's boss, I'd say that that's a higher likelihood that they have a good idea of what's going on and they somehow have access to some sort of internal structure that I had to you know, look up, right? So I'm gonna rate that particular threat a little bit higher than someone just sending it to info at company.org and uh, you know, it's blocked, right? So. Those are things to think about as you're building this out and packaging the data to other teams. So how do you make TTPs? How do you build out a threat library? How do you even start doing that? Well, I was gonna do a brief explanation and, and like a very brief training, but luckily, recently, Adam Pennington and Katie Nichols came out with a training at uh, MITRE ATT&CK and they pretty much go over all of it and I honestly could not do a better job than them. So I'm gonna refer you to their training materials. It's, they're very robust, they go into great detail as far as how to pull out the behaviors and the information that you have and to create a storyline and um, they do such a great job and I highly recommend that. If you just Google um, MITRE ATT&CK training uh, it'll it'll pull up for you, and I highly recommend looking at that. So threat grouping in action, I wanted to make it as easy as possible and not ask Defer to pretty much change everything they do, whether it's their collection or methodologies or whatever. And uh, so I decided to look at the e malicious email campaigns coming into the organization first and starting with one thing. I know it sounds simple, <laughs> But starting with one thing and uh, understanding that and building that out, understanding the TTPs and capability, and then looking at the infrastructure and then looking at the victim. Because I'm not going to, after all of the analysis is complete, you know, if you are familiar with the diamond model, um, I would be assigning after what? Uh, after multiple instances of a similar type of campaign, I would assign a threat activity group to it. So I leave, I leave adversary out of it, and I just look at the capability, which is TTPs, the infrastructure, which would be something like, uh, like the IP or them using Google Docs or MailChimp or um, SendGrid or things like that, right? And then uh, also the victimology. And then phase two, you can correlate it with the, the D for tickets, SOC tickets, and WAF data as well. So if you do decide to go down this route, um, Robert M. Lee recommends allowing flexibility with your naming structure. So if you are gonna call them like APT33 and you have like 20, 30 different threat activity groups, for me, um, it's hard to uh, remember all of that, you know, like, one four five two three one four three two like I after a while of juggling all the different threat activity groups I just I forget so uh, what I did is I pulled up this it's pretty straightforward I went to a hacker name generator you don't have to do that um, and this is pretty straightforward. I would be, I personally would be able to remember like wire, omega, guard, zero, delta. Like these are a little bit easier for me to relate to and to remember. 
and to understand and like track that within my own memory. So, and then the other thing is when you're pre prepping reports for the various teams, Christian Paredes, I don't know if you've seen this talk, but I highly recommend it. It's from the SAN CTI Summit 2017 and he gives you writing tips. And a lot of these, um, you can save yourself a lot of pain <laughs> by implementing some of this so that uh, you present the information in a way that people can actually consume it and understand. So for instance, uh, having a title, having a summary, having key points. I know it sounds really, um, really sim simplistic, but honestly, sometimes uh, having things that are simple and easy to understand and not convoluted with a lot of uh, complicated words is better. I'm a doctoral student, but just because I'm a doctoral student doesn't mean that I can't create things that are easily accessible for other people to consume, right? I leave the academic speak for academic stuff, if that makes sense. So, we're finally at the meat and taters. Adversary detection pipelines. So, uh, I. Actually, Joshua Stevens, he did a talk at RSA in 2015, and he broke it down into structured uh, for uh, data that the threat hunting team would need. So I'm like, okay, well then, for the adversary detection pipelines, breaking it down into structured and then unstructured. So structured would be uh, known threats, known TTPs, known IOCs. A kind of uh, real-time analysis, something that either the SOC would do, or let's say the uh, threat the the SOC has an enrichment of of like threat activity, or even your threat hunting group, and they're like, oh, let's let's do some structured threat hunting and see what we can find as far as like um, I don't know if you've ever done boss of the SOC and how they have like the Windows uh, event ID and then you have to like track badness and stuff like that. Let's say you wanted to have that. This is what structured, uh, structured data would be. Um, and then unstructured as well, and that's the undefined threat and new TTPs. So. So now, uh, once we have a basic understanding of all of that, I'm gonna go back up through, so I went top down, and then I'm gonna go bottom up now. So we're gonna start at the CTI team initiatives, and what do I mean by that? Uh, basically, when you get all of the data, I compile it in a way to where I get a broad view of what's going on. I get all of the data, and I track trends over time, right? Um, just handing this data to like the SOC or DFER or one of those people, they'll be like, oh, that's, that's great. Like, what do I focus on? It just looks like a bunch of lines and numbers. Like, what should I care about? What should I not care about? Um, so here's something that you can do for your email campaigns. You can look at the campaign volume. And this is tracking, you know, individual threats over time. The volume, the delivery, and then also to the clicked. Um, and so when you get that over time, it gives you a really good idea over either you have issues with your controls or they're really good at bypassing it, right? So ensuring that the various attacks that end up getting delivered, that all of that stuff is patched, um, prioritizing that, uh, looking into the various departments and teams that are being attacked by that, any specific uh, tailored information that they know to your particular organization and being aware of that over time. You can even do a campaign, campaign heat map. So with this, you get the delivery rates of the various threat activity groups that you found. So some of the things that you can do as a CTI analyst is you know such and such a TTPs that are associated with such and such a threat activity group, um, they're gonna be active coming up. Let's see, uh, override, right? So override is gonna be, let's see if I can circle it. So override is gonna be active in November, December. So what I would do leading up to that time, knowing that those particular threat activity groups are gonna be active is I would 
uh, try to find any information that I have or don't have uh, regarding any changes in TTPs, what other people are talking about, um, see if there is a change in the infrastructure, just get a good understanding of what's coming down the pipeline and being a little bit more proactive. The other thing is leveraging the MITRE attack navigator. So you can put all of these various TTPs in there and you can see what's overlapping between the various threat activity groups and then you can print that out and have a good, a good starting point to dive into looking at the controls or what's going on with that. I mean, obviously if you're working with email, the attack data in the email to begin with, there's gonna be a lot of either spear phishing attachment or spear phishing URL, right? So you got that, so that's out of the way. But then all the rest of the purple, looking at the other purple, like why are they attacking that particular uh, purples that overlap on here? What, what is it about that that uh, is popular with the various threat activity groups that you have? So as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, I would have the broad picture of what's going on with that, right? And then here's the malware variant TTPs. Um, I found tracking tracking the various malware that you get over time, even though there's you know it might be blocked or whatever. Just having a good understanding of how the trends are shifting as far as the attacks that are coming to your organization. Um, so what helps me is like if I have a good baseline or a good understanding of what's going on in the here and now and what we're being sent. When there's news articles out there that are related to that, like a new capability or a new way of the threat activity group sending, sending the particular badness or a new module that they added to the malware, um, it gives me a heads up to either let the teams know and mobilize it, you know, work on uh, suggesting something be patched, uh, anything to improve the security defenses of the org. So that's what I use this for. And then this is just another way to look at it if you don't like colors or maps, there's this. And then the unstructured adversary detection pipeline. So for me, um, what, I, what I do is I try to look at the threat activity groups, the areas that they're attacking, the people that they're going after. And this gives me, uh, you know, the people who click the most. For instance, if you have an internal phishing program, understanding the people that click the most is kind of a good idea because then you can see, oh, these people are clicking the most and they're getting the most attacks by such and such an activity group. Hmm, maybe I should increase the UBA score. So user behavioral analysis if you have that. Right, so these are just things to consider, and me, I just I understand the big picture, and then uh, the next steps are uh, packaging it for other teams. So threat actor dossiers, I take the threat activity groups, and I package it, um, and I have multiple variations. So I have ones that uh, go to management, right? Ones that go to uh, to other teammates is a suggestion. And then ones for the actual internal CTI team. So uh, for instance, let's say you have a coworker and there's more than just one person on the CTI team and they really love tradecraft and they love the history and they love to see the attacks trending over time. Then I would make that for the particular uh, analysts so that they can have that contextual information. Whereas red team, they'll be like, I don't care about all of that. I just want to know about the most recent like attacks, right? They'd be like, delete all of that. I don't care. Um, so here's just an example. And I try to be specific with the procedures in the event the threat hunting team wants to use it. And here's the finished product. Uh, you can put your recommendations in there. Uh, for instance, if they're using an IQI file and that's not currently blocked, making the recommendations to block that and putting that separately or putting that in a report or using it as metrics, uh, showing that from doing the various independent research for the CTI team, you were able to get such and such a thing blocked 
and that particular thing was being attacked by this particular threat activity group. So that helps with metrics and that helps uh, management and the higher ups uh, basically confirm your value to the org. And that was the talk of metrics. And then, so your internal security team, I already talked about prioritizing the various threat activity groups. So the CTI team, they get, they get a broad understanding of what's going on in the organization. Then you prioritize that and package it to the various teams based upon the goals, right? You don't wanna just slam them with a ton of information. You want to give them what is actionable, what is timely, and what's directly relevant to the goals of their various teams or departments. And SOC, Hunt, Defer, those are some people to have conversations with. And uh, sometimes it's nice to find out, hey, what's worked for you in the past as far as what I've done for you? What isn't working? Would you like this? Would you not like this? What do you want? What do you need? Um, having those type of conversations are exceedingly helpful. So basically you just take the same data and then it's you, co you copy paste and then you put a brief analysis with it. Same one if uh, Hunt wants to do unstructured, uh, unstructured threat hunting for Q1, you just narrow down that information, provide them the top targeted people or the least or the top uh, you know, parts of the, the teams or the network or whatever it is that you have set up, you, know, you provide that information to them within a specified time frame, not all time because that's just, that would be crazy and a lot of, <laughs> that would be too much. So you narrow it down to a quarter. And the thing that helps too is if they are aware of the known TTPs that are already hitting that particular sector of your network from your email attack data, they can have that information as contextual and then know what's already known essentially to find the unknown. So they can have a good idea with that. And the same thing with red. Just packaging the threat actor dossiers for them in a way that works. And Matt Kelly from B-Side Chicago, he did a great talk on uh, emulation exercises. So what I added in uh, to a spreadsheet is basically the historical information because sometimes with the attacks that you're getting via the campaigns, like not all of the information is there. So um, correlating the past stuff and the, and the present stuff that's going on so that red team can decide, you know, what type of historical stuff do I want to use since it's missing in the most recent stuff when they're running emulation exercises. And then purple teaming. If you want a better idea of purple teaming, the Central Bank of Ireland actually put out a really great, uh, really long research information and like a framework and described a lot of the purple team successes that they've experienced. So I would highly recommend checking that out. And Eric, he is actually the course author of SEC 599, which is uh, defending against advanced adversaries and purple team. And uh, he did this in one of his webcasts. If you are interested at all in purple team, I highly recommend watching any of his stuff. And so tracking uh, what the tools the red team needs, uh, how blue team detected it, um, and kind of getting a heat map of the various controls and what happened with the emulation and purple team ex exercises. Security team initiatives, just creating the reports and helping the managers with metrics and tracking over time, uh, like for instance, CTI provided X amount of information towards uh, red team and they were able to successfully emulate an exercise and X amount of controls were either modified or updated or brought on board as a result of this particular emulation exercise. So that's something to do. And then finally doing a cyber threat landscape report. So this would be helpful for I guess you could say the managers of your organization to track the purple team operations, track how Hunt is leveraging the data and how that's been beneficial to your organization, any gaps that are occurring, and then also to uh, track a document communication and procedural shifts as a result of 
implementing and moving forward with getting more use out of your threat intelligence. And business initiatives, just looking at the third parties, like I said earlier, looking at the internal attacks that are happening uh, or being directed towards the people that are specific to the organization with respect to whatever initiatives it is that you find in the annual report 10K, 10Q, um, even with small businesses, I used to set yearly goals, so I would be aware of that um, and communicate accordingly to my clients. And when you're engaging the various people, you have to think of it kind of like prospecting. So not everyone is going to be on board. So um, like, don't don't get disheartened. Like, just find the people that are interested in working with you and that want the data, um, and focus on those and providing value to those people. Like, you're not going to win everyone, but the people that you do win, uh, you can make a meaningful change and add value to the organization. So basically, adversary detection pipelines are analysis of prioritized threats via structured and unstructured formats for an adversary detection pipeline focused on business, departmental, and CTI initiatives. So that is it. This is me, MBA, uh, doctoral student, <laughs> lots of sand certs. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or now, and I have three shirts to give away. Thank you.